Hello. Hi. Katie's not here, so I'm left trying to figure out what I'm supposed to do at the beginning of the show. And I know she has fancy graphics in here. So I'm just going to talk for a second in hopes that uh, Katie decides to come back. Katie, are you waiting in the wings somewhere? Anywhere? Trying to save me? No? Okay. Well, Katie's not waiting in the wings. You know me. I'm Jay. And I am usually one of the co-hosts of the show. At the moment, I am the solo host while Katie's trying to uh, to fix up some technical issues. Uh, but it's another Saturday night. And this is Spilling Ink. You know what it is. Oh, there's Katie. There's Katie. She's going to save us. She's going to save us. And she's back. I'm going to save we go. you. Wait, what did you do? What? Nothing. I just don't know how to play the videos. <laughs> so there's Katie. That's the boss. She's over there. She's going to take over and do the hard stuff now. All right. All right. So what did I miss while I was trying to reboot? Uh, we were pretty much talking about you. Good or bad? Well, I mean, neutral. Okay. Yeah, I'll accept that. <laughs> All right, then, since you haven't run the uh, the sponsor video, we better pay homage to our sponsors before they get mad because we know they're watching. So here it comes. Hello, everybody. I am Joe Compton, and welcome to our channel, Go Indie Now. This is the place that celebrates indie artists and indie art. And we He's do so, so by producing several shows that either air on daily, weekly, monthly, or seasonal scheduling. And within those shows, we aim to educate and entertain you. If you're if you're an indie artist who's trying to figure out how to do this, this is the place you need to be. If you're an indie artist who's looking to promote and doesn't have any avenues and, and is tired of the grind, this is the place to be. Because remember, it's always time to go indie now. That's right. Always, always I'm, time to go in now. I'm just mesmerized every time he speaks. He's just, he's got such a presence, doesn't he? Yep. It's That's like he should, boss. He should get into film because he's, he's just, he's, he's so, he's so good. Oh, he hi, Anita. That's a good idea. Oh, he should. He should try that. Oh, so how's life been for you? Well, it was uh, Thanksgiving weekend this weekend. And uh, even though it was a, a homebound Thanksgiving, I still say it was pretty good. We had a feast, and I have enough leftovers that I don't have to cook for another week. So, win-win. Yeah, that's what it's all about. And and we have the rest of my family gets out of quarantine tomorrow. So, they are all very excited about that. They have been trapped here for a month straight, unable to leave the house, um, which was kind of unfair to them because Emma and I were the ones that were positive for COVID. And the way, oh, there's two Stacys. That's fun. And the way it goes down, or, or at least the health department's guidelines here, were that you're quarantined for your 14 days, right? But the rest of your family members, their quarantine starts at the end of your quarantine. So they're quarantined for double the time. So it, it really kind of it really kind of hosed them, which is which is a major bummer. So they're all desperate to get out. But enough about you and I, Katie. We have guests to attend. That's right. We have some wonderful guests to introduce you to, and they are about to release a book this Monday, Prairie Gothic. So we need to hear a little bit more about this. Should we do eeny, meeny, miny, mo? Or wait, wait. We, do I, we just, I just, I've just got to say here that this is a gorgeous, gorgeous graphic here. I mean, that is just beautiful. I absolutely love that. So kudos to uh, to the designer on that. My my uh my eldest daughter actually did the cover art for the book. Um, really? really talented. <laughs> That's awesome, and I love your your raven on the skull in the background there. That's that's oh, awesome. I'm sorry, wow. your audio is really garbled. I can't understand. Oh, it is definitely a Murphy's Law I'm day today. Problems. I'm sorry. I, I'm just giving you compliments. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll pick someone else then uh, to introduce the book to us. We can either go with Chris or Marty. Which one of you? Who's feeling brave right now? 
Well, Stacy is actually the editor. Stacy's the editor. <laughs> she's the, she's, she knows all about the anthology, so I, I can talk about it from my perspective as an author. Okay. Uh, Stacy really wanted to sort of push out and reach to uh, a bunch of talented writers uh, to write uh, sort of a, a horror anthology uh, that had a setting in the prairies. So they, they, want, they really wanted to embrace the notion of a prairie setting but use it in an atmospheric way because oftentimes when we think about uh, horror stories or gothic stories, you think about uh, urban centers, something that that's uh, maybe a little more sort of old uh, in, in terms of era. Uh, and so uh, Stacy wanted to focus on something that was near and dear to a lot of our hearts, people who live on the prairies, to come up with stories that would sort of capture a sense of the setting of uh, where we live. And, and if you live anywhere on the prairies, you know that it's like a big open sky and you can see for pretty much forever. Like I'm from Alberta, uh, but we also, we often make a joke about uh, people from Saskatchewan, which is the province right next to ours, uh, that uh, uh, your dog runs away and three days later you can still see them running. So that gives you a sense of like how vast the prairies are. Uh, so, so each author was given a challenge to come up with a, a, a gothic or a horror story uh, set in the prairies and, and everybody took their own sort of unique bent into it. Uh, with my uh, story, I, uh, mine's called Insatiable and it's about uh, uh, a guy who's dealing with the guilt of something that he did long ago and it's set in the 1800s. Uh, this fellow uh, was a foreman on the uh, railroad project where they were constructing uh, the railroad through the Rocky Mountains uh, between Alberta and BC. They're, they're two sort of neighboring provinces. Uh, and he hired a lot of cheap labor and uh, some of them died in the construction of the railroad. And uh, he sort of dispensed with the bodies in a not so nice way. And uh, years later when he had profited off of all their earnings or all their labor, uh, he was visited by somebody uh, who was uh, trying to track down the bones of, of one of the deceased workers. And uh, that sort of sparks uh, sort of a haunting in uh, this man's mind or, or a real haunting, we don't know which, and ultimately has to sort of confront his past. Uh, so, so that's sort of my take on uh, a prairie gothic story. That sounds, that sounds pretty, pretty cool. cool. And, oh, see, I'm hearing the echo on me now too. That's weird. Have you have any of you read the um, the story Daughters Unto Devils, something like that? Oh no, oh. I I just read it in the last couple of years, and it's the first book that I've read that I would have described as a prairie gothic type of feel, um, and, and it was unique because I never read anything like it. But uh, it almost had the the kind of feel like um, that movie the the witch, uh, where it had like the two V's for the W. Um, you know, that kind of feel just really kind of bleak um, and dark and slow burn kind of the, the whole way. But, uh, but yeah, it's it's a it's a really different setting from what we normally see or read, I think. So I, I don't think as many people have explored that. That sounds right up your alley, Jay. Yeah, for sure. That, that is definitely like your genre right there. Yeah, love it. Love the love the good dark creepy stuff. Well, Chris, what what about you? What uh, what was your contrib contribution to this anthology? Um, first, I'm gonna ask who wrote that book because I want to look it up now. Well, Do you remember? I'll I'll tell you what. I'll look it up on the other screen right now while while we're talking. Okay. <laughs> I, I know that uh, it was actually an author that I had looked into her because she was coming to. Um, the Grand Rapids Comic Con. And in the past, I'd gone and interviewed people there. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to go. And so I was researching the authors and reading their books. And then COVID happened, of course, and everything changed. But uh, but yeah, I remember it was uh, it was pretty intense. So I'm looking it up right now. Daughters Unto Devils. Let's see here. This was by... This is by um, Amy Lukovics. Okay. Yeah. I'll remember that. <laughs> yeah. So check it out. Yeah. Amy L. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And I'll find it. Um, my contribution. Well, unlike Stacey and Marty, I actually grew up on the West coast and I've only been living on the prairies for five and almost, yeah, five years. And so to write a story on the prairies, a Gothic horror story was a bit of a challenge for me because 
um, I'm not as familiar with it. And the thing that I found uh, most striking was there's so much sky and land. It was almost claustrophobic. And then you add the snow onto that and uh, it just, even though it's vast, you can see all this sky and all this land, and then there's snow, it just feels so small and in a box. So that's, I, So my story was about a woman uh, whose family had a, a cabin in Stetler, and she comes from Vancouver to, to stay in the cabin um, to heal from, from an incident. And so a lot of it is her impressions too of, you know, winter on the prairies. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much, see, I'm doing that thing again where I have to talk about me and it's not going so well. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's take Chris, let's take Chris off the big screen here. It's a little little less intimidating. There you go. Um, so when Stacy, yeah, so when Stacy and Jim approached me to write a story, that was the first thing that um, I thought about was the claustrophobic feeling of the prairies for somebody living on the west coast. Uh, where the land is water and it's fluid. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then the, um, what I like about Gothic stories as well is the uh, atmosphere and setting. You can almost make the setting a character unto itself. So I worked with the snow and the cold and the setting of the cabin because I only have one character in my story. And so I tried to create the setting as a secondary character to play off of um, my character who, you know, leaves you wondering if she's the unreliable narrator or if she's crazy or if these things actually really did happen. Well, and that that in itself is a special kind of talent. And, and that's one of the things that I am weakest at is is setting, is developing the setting into something that the reader or viewer can see and feel and taste and almost touch. Um, and it's, it really is a mark of a, a good writer when, when you, when you feel like you're in that setting. Um, but you know, it's funny what you said about the, the prairie and the sky being so vast that it's almost claustrophobic because it, it's not something that I think people would normally think, but I, I understand that, you know, if when, it, when I'm on a, on a boat out in Lake Michigan, all of that openness makes me feel really tight in my chest. It makes me kind of go like this a little bit. And I don't know what it is about. I'm not afraid of water. I'm not afraid of boats. I think it's just too much. There's too much vastness out there, you know? You feel how truly small you are in the grand yeah. scheme of things. Yeah. Well, Stacy, can you, can you understand me? Yes, I can. I can sort of hear you. You're still a bit garbled, but I'm making things out. <laughs> okay, tell us about the anthology. Yeah, so I, I I I was born and raised on the prairies, and I have a huge soft spot for the Canadian prairies. I think they're beautiful. Um, a lot of people think when you mention you know the, the prairie landscapes, they think flat and boring, and I think that the prairies are actually anything but. Um, they they are flat, but they also harbor just like incredible ecosystems. Um, they 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 harbor things that are hidden, and I sort of felt like it could be just a super awesome setting for for a horror story, right? And I don't think that the prairies have been used very well at all as as a setting for horror fiction. So I started thinking about this concept and and how prairie settings could be leveraged for horror fiction and uh, had, had a really great conversation with Jim Jackson um, about a year and a half ago at, at a writer's conference called Creative Inc. in Burnaby, BC. And he was really interested in the concept of, of doing sort of gothic horror set in the Canadian prairies. And, and so we decided to do this anthology. And I wanted to to limit the contributors to people who are currently living um, on the Canadian prairies and, and a part of the setting so that we could really, really get, get a sense of what the prairies mean to different people in, in the context of horror fiction. So it, it's been kind of a passion project for me that, that I've really had a lot of fun doing. And the contributors that we, we uh, 
invited to write stories all just knocked my socks off. I just have nothing but amazing things to say about each and every story that, that came to the table. Really, really awesome stuff. How many, uh, how many submissions did you end up getting for this anthology? Yeah, we, we actually only did it on invitation. So everybody that we invited is in, in the book. Like everybody just did amazing stories. <laughs> That's really cool. So I think including um, myself, we have like 14. Wow. Uh, and I, That's I, a I, lot to put together. Just, just from an editing perspective. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I have a I have a question for you guys about uh, I have a question for you about kind of developing your your settings here and and Katie if you want to chime in on this too uh, the last two books I read and not on purpose have both taken place in the Amazon um, and so I'm learning all sorts about the Amazon River basins and the and the the floodplains and all the crazy creatures that are out there and indigenous people that live in the Amazon. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking that in order to write something like this, you have to have so much knowledge or have done so much research about these places to get them right and to make, make your reader feel like they're there. You know, how did, how did you guys go about creating that, uh, that setting for the, the readers? Is this just something that you knew because you live there or did you have to do a lot of additional research? Uh, for me, uh, I, because I'd gr grown up on the prairies, it, it was a very familiar place to write about. So a lot of the inspiration that I drew for setting just came out of my own observations. Uh, I mean, you live in a place long enough, you get a real sense of what it's like. Sometimes you take it for granted and you just have to remind yourself. Um, I also find that um, visiting the place that you're writing about uh, really helps uh, solidify what it is. I mean, it's one thing to do research on the internet or, or you dig into books and, and try to get a sense of a place. Uh, but I think uh, you, you really need a 3D immersive experience sometimes if you want to make that setting come to life for the reader. Uh, I, I remember working on another, uh, another series uh, that was set in 1890s New York. And I, I could do all the reading that I wanted about what New York was like in the 1890s. But I really, I really need to to go to that city. I didn't go back in time. There's no time machine involved in this. Uh, but I, I went to New York and just walked up and down the streets. And some of the some of the neighborhoods uh, are still standing from from that particular time. Like they're cobblestone streets that you walk on, and you realize cobblestone doesn't mean it's like nice and even and paved. It's kind of like like an ocean in the sense that it's kind of wavy and and. Most of it sort of has been smoothed out, but every now and then you can sort of trip on a, a loose piece of stone. And, and so just getting that sort of immersive experience gives you a sense of, of that place in a way that uh, internet or paper research won't give you. So, so I think it's important that if, if you're talking about trying to write setting is any opportunity that you have to actually be in the place that you're writing about, even if it's sort of a, a sort of a, 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 a comparison place like obviously if somebody's writing fantasy you're not going to sort of create a, a fantastic world but if you can sort of simulate the place that you want to write about and be there um i don't know if it gives you the exact details of what you need to describe like let's say when you're talking about the amazon uh but it does give you a sense of something that you can't get just from from pure intellectual research uh it gives you that feel that sense and sometimes when i read uh stories by writers i can i can get a sense of whether or not they've actually been in that setting or not, because it just feels like a difference between, I'm gonna throw you a whole bunch of details that I read about versus I'm gonna create the world that you're going to inhabit. And I, I can always tell when somebody is creating a world that they've inhabited because I'm just immersed in that setting right away, as opposed to trying to pluck out, out these little bits of research details uh, that they're throwing in there to sort of establish a sense of authenticity. Wow, very well said. I, <laughs> yeah, I very, very. I just well keep said. talking until somebody interrupts me. No, no, yeah. No, that's good. No, that's and absolutely I and good. I I can I can totally feel that. And the, and there are books like that where you read them and and you just see there's just little snippets here and there that are like, why was that thrown in there? Is that just so that we think you know what you're talking about? And no, so that makes sense. Well, what what about uh, you two, Stacy? Do you write as well, or are, are is editing your your sole job here? 
Yeah, no, I did write a story for the anthology as well. Um, and it's it's set its setting is sort of loosely based on my grandparents' farm in southern Alberta, where I spent a lot of time as a child. Um, there there weren't monsters there though when I was growing up. <laughs> but um, the, the setting for me, like in, in integrating little pieces of what I already knew, really was at the root of of. The setting within the story so being able to really capture the the, the farm setting um the, the chicken coop that's in the story how when you open the door to the chicken coop and the, the dust motes kind of pop puff up in the sunlight coming through the cracks and in, in the chicken coop walls um little things like that right the, the sound of the grass when it's windy um trying to bring all of that to life for the reader, because if, if you haven't experienced it, you just don't know what it's like. I, I like how you were just romanticizing opening the chicken coop door when really it's pretty gross. Guys. <laughs> when you open that chicken coop door, it's, it's nasty. <laughs> just but no, that's, that's, I, love <laughs> I, do, I do too. I have them in my, uh, in my backyard and they're, they're great, but they're just, they're, they're very messy creatures. They're, they're, they're really nature's messy. trash compactors, right? <laughs> but no, no, I, I, I think that's, I think that that is a, that is a beautiful thing. Um, there's someone else that, um, that really does that well, um, bringing, um, kind of romanticism and I don't say romanticism in a, in a bad way. I'm using that in a, in a really complimentary way, uh, to the, the ordinary or, or mundane experiences of, of living. And that is, um, um, Olivia Hawker, um, who has written absolutely phenomenal fiction. Uh, one for the Blackbird, one for the Crow is just a, really a masterpiece um, of, of fiction. And that also took place out on, out on the plains, I believe, but I wouldn't call it a gothic horror by any means. But, uh, but yeah, so I, I think that creating beauty out of the mundane and ordinary that most people don't get to experience is, is, a, is a really great thing to do. What about you, Chris? How did you uh, go about uh, developing this world for everyone? Um, like I said before, I focus on the claustrophobic and the snow. Um, and I didn't want to write something in the city because the Calgary cities is what I know um, about the prairies because uh, this, this is where I've been for the past five years. But we have driven between here and Edmonton. And if anybody has driven between Calgary and Edmonton, it is flat, 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 flat. And you'll see these little um, places that I call them cabins. I'm actually really not too sure what they are, just dotted every once in a while. You can see them from the road. There'll be like an access road going down and then you there's this building that looks like a little cabin. Um, and because I wanted my character to be in isolation, complete isolation, um, I picked Stetler because I, my dad's family is from Stetler. I've driven past Stetler. I've, I've never actually stopped there. Sorry, Marty. <laughs> I didn't, you know, immerse myself into Stetler. Um, and I lost my train of thought. So that's what I did is I just wanted her isolated and flat, somewhere cold. And those little cabins that um, I would see driving from between Calgary and Edmonton, I always wondered what was in them. So I decided, well, she's going to go into one of those. That's going to be a cabin. That's what those little buildings are that are at the end of these little access roads that you see every once in a while um, on that long three-hour drive. <laughs> you, know, you know, Chris, hearing you talk about that like that, it makes me think that you really, really need to search out that book that I was talking about. Yeah. You, you're going to dig it because it's... I, I, I'm not going to spoil anything for you, but I, I'll just tell you, you're going to dig it because it's right in that vein that you're just talking about. But no, and I think that we all research uh, differently. You know, I, I like to watch documentaries and and read as much as I can. You know, one of my short stories was in late 1800s uh, Chicago. And of course, we can't go to late 1800s Chicago, but there are an absolute ton of resources <laughs> on the late 1800s in America. So you can, you can find out a lot of... Uh, info there but it's always kind of been my dream to be able to actually go on location to research a story you know you know if you if you read anything by uh, dan brown and some people love him some people hate him author of the, the da vinci code you know you you read 
about Rome and the Vatican and, and the twisting and turning and the catacombs. And it's like, wow, it's, it's like, wow, this guy really did the research. It's like, I could almost recreate the, the, these uh, paths that they took. And I, I think that's pretty incredible. But yeah. Katie, Katie writes fantastical world, worlds that I don't think can be recreated here. So how do you go about developing those settings? Sorry, Chris, I, I kind of talked over you No, there. I was just going to build on, on that and what Marty said. Like this Prairie Gothic story is the first story I've written that actually has a, a real real live setting because I'm like you, I can't travel to all these places. And, and so I make up my own cities and towns and I mash their mashups of places that I've actually been. So, because I can't go immerse in, in, I can't write a story in New York because I've only been there once for, you know, two days. I can't write a story in Chicago. So I'll take all the cities and towns that I've been to and I'll make my own. So How the much? Prairie Gothic was different for me because it was the first time I actually placed it somewhere that exists. How much of, of Google Maps comes into play when you're trying to, to recreate a scene or a setting that you haven't been to before? Oh, for All me, the time. yeah, it's it, that's invaluable. Because <laughs> I figure that's the only other way you can attempt to, to create something that's immersive and realistic is if, if you can't physically be there, you go virtually and you do street view and you virtually walk the streets and, and try and recreate it from there. Mm -hmm. So tell us what, it, what it's been like. I mean, I know the pandemic is most of what's been on people's mind for the last year and we're all sick of it. Um, but, uh, you know, what's it, what's it like, uh, planning a new release in 2020? Yeah. Well, I mean, it obviously didn't go the way I dreamt about it before the pandemic hit. I really, really wanted to have an in-person book launch and, and be able to be out there, you know, doing conferences and things like that in person. So, um, learning how to embrace this virtual world has been a learning curve <laughs> and dealing with the, the tech issues involved in the virtual world. Um, but I, I, I feel like everybody at this point is now, you know, kind of into a groove with, with what the pandemic means and, and is, is starting to get better at, at connecting virtually until we're allowed to connect in person again. Okay. It's, yeah, I think that for the, the, those of us who are online a lot, it's not that much of a difference in in life. But I, I don't know. It, it's it's always for me. It's being told not to do something makes it that much more desirable. <laughs> you know? Oh, naughty, naughty Jay! <laughs> but you know, I I follow the rules. I I you know I I do what I'm supposed to do, and uh, I still ended up with the with the virus. So it, it's you know even if you do everything right things can still go wrong but i'm i'm still here and, I, and i'm fairly healthy now so it's kind of like okay well i i got off really easy when many many people are not getting off easy so i've just got to be got to be thankful for for that part of it but uh but yeah i imagine not being able to do physical launches and go to bookstores and things like that is 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 tough Oh, and I just see something popped up from Joe. A Jim Jackson concert or him playing a soundtrack behind live readings would have to be a sight to see. I agree, Joe. You know, he actually sent me um, a demo of a song that he was that he was working on that was really cool. I mean, guys, just he's a really talented guy. <laughs> now, Joe did ask us a question a little earlier. Did you catch that? No. Oh, there we go. Uh, for anyone who's just going to be listening on a podcast and can't see this question, uh, Go Wendy now asks, "What's something you all learned about the prairie that you didn't know going into writing your stories?" Anybody? Chris Mars. Yeah, I think because I'm born and raised here, I didn't learn anything. I was good. What Come I on, know. we got it. We... Yeah, because I wrote based on my experience with the prairie. I didn't either. Come on, somebody give Joe something. He wants to know that you learned something, guys. <laughs> oh, you're muted. <laughs> uh, sorry, I don't know if I learned anything specific while I was working on my particular short story, but uh, sort of uh, platforming or piggybacking on what Chris talked about, like the Stetler. Uh, 
there, there's some value in just curiosity and just looking around, whether it be uh, in-person research or, or paper research. Sometimes when you're doing research on a setting, you're so laser focused on, on what you want to find in the setting that you forget to let curiosity guide you into different places. And so when Chris was talking about like that stretch of uh, highway between Calgary and Edmonton and, and, and how you pick Stettler, I instantly thought about uh, a road trip that my wife and I took a few years ago. And we were sort of driving around the Stettler area and we came across this tiny, tiny, it's not even a town. I think, I think they would call it a hamlet or a village. It was called Torrington. And uh, there was a tourist attraction in this like tiny one gas station town. And, you know, you're on vacation, you're doing a road trip. You're like, oh, you know, what the hell? Let's let's go visit. Right. We walked into this tourist attraction in Torrington and it was a, a, a gopher museum. So so basically the operator had collected all the different like prairie dogs and gophers that were in the area. I, I guess apparently she got uh, farmers to like trap them, kill them and, and send their their bodies to her museum. And she proceeded to stuff them and arrange them in little dioramas that capture different scenes. Uh, some of them were just like prairie scenes. So you just had like a, a little a gopher in a dress and a farmer like sitting down at a dinner table. And some of them were like uh, gopher firefighters that were fighting a blaze in a tiny little diorama building. And I think, uh, I think there was one of a, a gopher astronaut as it was climbing into a rocket and it was about to take off to the moon. And it was like this wonderful discovery. And, and apparently uh, in the, uh, the museum, the operator had a, a world map with little uh, push pins marking where everybody had come from. And this thing was littered with push pins from people who'd actually somehow found out about the Torrington Gopher Museum and traveled. I don't know if they traveled specifically to see the Gopher Museum, but they definitely made a stop on, on <laughs> in, in their travels to Alberta. So, so to me, that's an example of how uh, when you let your curiosity uh, guide you, it's amazing what you can discover. Because sometimes uh, when we don't know what to expect, that's when uh, stories get to be the most exciting. Well, and, and of course, Jay had I, to find the link for I, it. <laughs> I have just posted the link to the Gopher Museum because I'll be going there the next time I go to Canada. Um, it sounds amazing. Thank you, Torrington. Um, you know, and it's, it's, it's funny that you that you talk about curiosity like that. And I a hundred percent agree. You know, I, I have, um, and it's gotten worse over the years. I have super bad anxiety, especially in social situations, like in-person social situations, not online. And, and so in this last year, when, when, when I'm in a social situation, I have been just kind of blocking out all the other humans around and I just wander around and, I have found myself just studying the oddest things, you know, certain trees or plants or, you know, whatever it is that's, that's around me, I'll just kind of fixate on it. And I, I feel like a little lost child sometimes, but, you know, I just, you know, it's my, the anxiety has kind of forced me into this path, but I, I am, it, I feel like I'm seeing more things now like 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 you said opening yourself up to things i i feel like in closing myself off to humans i've opened myself up to the to the world a lot more which uh probably this isn't an ideal situation so i wouldn't recommend that to anyone out there but uh but yes it, it's working for uh it's working for me yes julia we we love our social anxiety don't we hon so we we have a, a question here um from world without rule of law okay I've been writing prepper fiction, which I narrate on YouTube over a slideshow. Can you offer any ideas or tips on how to publish? I've self-published on Kindle, but looking for something broader. Katie, you're going to want to take this one. That's something that's going to require a lot more than a simple answer. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately. Well, what's, what, what's the other place that we use? The... Well, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of avenues to publishing and, and really it all depends on what your goal is. So for something like that, I would say, you know, look into uh, draft to digital, look into Ingram spark, look into smash words, smash look into words, publish drive. Saying. There's a lot of avenues to go when you're trying to publish and reach the widest market, but each one's going to have different rules. Each one's going to have different stipulations and different royalty percentages. So really it's, it's all about doing your research. I, I think that Smashwords, or at least years ago when I when I played around it with it, was a 
a good solution because you you upload to Smashwords uh, on that interface and it gets distributed to to all these different channels. But I I know that we have talked about this on on several episodes before, um, although searching through them might not be easy. But um, but yeah, so uh, you know I would I would actually do a search for how to publish my manuscript wide, you know how to self publish my manuscript wide. Um, because wide means multiple platforms, um, not just Amazon. Um, yeah. Uh, sorry, that, that's that's a question that requires a very very long answer, much longer than the uh, than the thirty minutes we have left. Um, but but uh, but it's a good topic to use for yeah. a show in the future to to really go over the nitty gritty on on self publishing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you are welcome. World without rule of law. Ah, uh, whoa, whoa, what were we talking about before? Did we were we going in a certain direction, Katie? I I, I, I feel like I, I've been I, talking too much. I squirreled off at Gophers and and that oh was my it. gosh, the Gophers! I am. I mean, I've got the website pulled up on the other other screen here. I am enthralled by this. This this is exactly what my wife and I love to do. Is just weird stuff that's like where. Why did you get it in your head to do this? <laughs> well, I don't know if it's like this where, where you're at, but in Alberta, uh, I, I think like about 25, maybe 30 years ago, the, the provincial government here uh, wanted to encourage tourism to Alberta. So they, they had a pot of money for different small communities to come up with their own tourist attractions. And now I don't know if the Torrington Gopher Museum came out of that, but I do know that if you drive around Alberta, you'll see the oddest tourist attractions in Glendon, uh, there's there's a giant pierogi, a giant pierogi on a fork. Uh, <laughs> up in St. Paul, there's a UFO landing site. Uh, we actually have a town. Uh, Stacy will probably know this better than I do, uh, but Vulcan, Alberta, uh, actually has the, uh, the the Star Trek Star Trek uh, Enterprise, uh, a, a replica of that, and they actually have a, a a summer festival where they they celebrate all things Star Trek. Oh, uh, so cool. if, if you do just a little drive around Alberta and visit all those small towns, it, like yeah. I said, your curiosity will take you to the most wonderful and strangest things that we have in this province. <laughs> well, I, I'm going to. Um, there's a, like a giant goose statue in Hannah, Alberta, and there's like the big teepee in Medicine Hat, and there's the, the egg. Where's where's the egg? I can't remember. Oh, that's the uh, Vegreville, the Sanka, the Pesanka. Yeah. Yeah, um, there's a there's a skunk in Bicycler, a big skunk statue. <laughs> so, like, there's just really weird things in in southern Alberta. Um, but yeah, we we were talking about learning things though, and as Marty and Chris yes. were talking, it it made me it made me um, remember that as the editor of the anthology, it was really really interesting to me to learn about what really resonated strongly with each of the contributing authors and and it's a different part of the prairies in every story that really seemed to resonate with each author so it's not just one thing about the prairie setting that um, each author is talking about it, it it really is looking at the prairies through the lens of each author and each different person and, and how that how, how they wanted to leverage that within their stories it was really cool it was a learning experience for me. For me, it kind of speaks to the 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 voice of each author. Like when when you talk about setting and the details you choose to describe. You know, uh, uh, I think Jay, when he heard about your description of the chicken coop, he had a different image of what chicken coop would be versus yours. And so I found it fascinating to hear those two. Uh, reaction side by side because it really told me a lot about how each author crafts their own voice by the details they choose to put in their stories, whether it be a detail about the setting, a detail about the character. Uh, so the details that we choose as authors really shape our our worldview and it also shapes our authorial uh, voice. And that's the thing I love about creative writing is that you can give something like with Prairie Gothic, I want, you know, uh, gothic horror stories set on the prairies and you had 14 authors that went all in different directions in terms of how they interpreted that and each one of them is valid because their voice uh, sort of shone through uh, in, in terms of how they tackled that particular setting and it gave you a sense of like how everybody can can arrive at a story 
from different viewpoints and and uh, pick up on the most amazing, sometimes minute and sometimes big details. And and to me, that's what makes writing exciting. Exactly. Oh, for sure. I also love that um, not all of the stories were set in rural or, or farm environments either. We have some stories in the Prairie Gothic anthology that are urban centers on the prairies, right? So what, what that brought to the story as well was really fascinating to me. Well, and, you know, and, and that's just, you know, a reminder that everything we do, everything we write, you know, is the, the readers see it through the lens that is us. You know, they see these settings through how we pr have perceived them. And that, it's just something to remember, you know, is when when you're writing to keep that in mind that you know my my experiences might not be everyone's. And most of the time that's that's OK, but it can be a responsibility as well, you know, especially when it comes down to social awareness that how we're talking about other people and in, in places can definitely affect maybe how a reader is going to view those people in places. So to be a little bit responsible with that as well. I think that's also why that, it, it, that meme. Oh, go ahead. I also think that's why it's so it hurts so much when you get rejected for the stories that you submit because there is your your sort of personal investment yeah. in that. So like when you get a rejection from an editor, or publisher, or an agent, you, you kind of take it personally because you know that that's like your viewpoint that's being rejected. I mean, you get rejected enough times, you build the callus and and you go, okay, I, I can get used to it. But but still, at a certain point, uh, when you put yourself out there, it, it's it's hard when somebody rejects it. Yeah. I also enjoyed how um, the just... in the anthology brought weather into the equation because the prairies in the wintertime is a very different place from the prairies in the summertime and rain on the prairies is very, very different from winter. So that's an interesting dynamic too, I thought. And Chris did a great job bringing in winter, like intense, intense winter. <laughs> Go ahead, Chris, you're about to say something. Thank you, Stacey, I was on mute. <laughs> I was trying to say thanks. <laughs> I just want to make a comment about the whole perspectives thing. And, and the, the meme that just came up to mind when you guys were talking about that is that one person standing on one end of the six and the other person standing on the other end seeing it as a nine. And they're both pointing and, and arguing about what they're seeing. And it's the same thing that they're seeing, but just from different viewpoints. And it really does show, you know, everybody sees things in a little bit different light. And and when you have so many people writing about the same area, you really do get to see the picture of, of how everyone else is seeing this. Yep. That's all we, we had, uh, who did we have on? I believe, was it the dynamic duo, Josh Robertson and Andy uh, uh, Penguin? Uh, Pelican, <laughs> Pelican, Andy Pelican. Um, uh, and I, I think that that was the episode that uh, we were talking about uh, perspective and how it completely changes the story. And, and no, it's funny, it was Craig. It was what? Craig, I think. Craig? Okay. Craig Louie, I think, was the one that, that was that episode. Okay. Okay. Yeah, he's fantastic as well. If you haven't read his book, Our War, oh my God, read that freaking book. It's it's insane, especially with America the way it is. Um, anyhow, God bless the USA and all that jazz. Uh, but okay, but but perspective, you know, it's it's such um, it's such an interesting thing, and it's something that we all know that different perspectives change everything until you really dive into it and really see how much it changes everything. Um, you know, and I'm since that talk, I, I've kind of sought out more books that are are told from strange perspectives and uh, i'm i'm really really enjoying them um you know strange perspectives strange settings at least things that are strange to me um and i and i think that that's been a it's been a really enjoyable thing and i think it's it's opening my eyes to to new experiences and and i think that's a a really cool thing so i kind of went no, in a direction important. i don't know People what we're should doing. expose themselves to different perspectives different viewpoints because it does help you grow as a person it's how you develop your empathy for the characters you create, because I don't think everybody writes a character that uh, uh, they love or identify with because uh, you need antagonists. Uh, so so if you write an antagonist that that is basically just a flip side of who you are, uh, really, you, you don't have any conflict. So so as writers, it, it's part of our responsibility to be able to put our, ourselves in other people's shoes so that we can write about them in a way that can resonate with the reader. 
Uh, otherwise, then you've just got cookie cutter characters. They're doing the exact same thing. All they have is different names and different costumes. Yep. For sure. Well, the idea and, of developing empathy is is so important because the only way you can develop empathy is to truly understand the way that somebody else is approaching something. And when you develop that empathy for the characters, you're making the characters feel as real as possible to the readers so that they can understand the perspectives. You know, even the, the villain, the villain is supposed to be the hero of their story. Their motivations make them the good guy, even though they're doing horrible things, they don't see it in that same light. Yeah. Well, in the book yeah. I'm reading right now, it's a, has a, a very flat villain. Um, you know, he's, he's in it for the money and because he likes to cause chaos and like, okay, great. What, whatever. I mean, it's, it's an entertaining story and I, and I'm, I'm really liking the, the settings and uh, the setting in the Amazon. Cause I love learning about it, but it's like, okay, well you, you really could have done something a lot better with that because it's just been done so many times and it's, it's so easy to do. You know, and I think that when you when you get into really good bad guys and stories, they're they're not really villains at all. They're they're people that are taking a different path than maybe what the majority would take. Um, and and that puts them at odds with, with our protagonist, and that's how they end up being the bad guy. But you know, I it's if you look at it from their point of view, maybe it really wouldn't seem all that bad. You know, yeah. you know, it, maybe if the story was told from, um, you know, X's point of view instead of Y's point of view, you wouldn't think they're a bad guy. And that's just something to remember. Well, I think that's one of the challenges that every writer faces, right? Because because when you come up with a story, like you either start with character, you start with setting or you start with the plot. And I, I find that sometimes if somebody starts with the story, the plot, uh, they're kind of like in a helicopter circling over the story and they kind of know the exact route that the story is supposed to take, right? And so the characters become uh, pieces or puppets that are moved for the sake of the plot. Like, I need this character to do this thing in order for me to trigger the climax. And while that is perfectly fine to develop the story and build all the pieces you need structurally to have the story flowing and moving well, it, it does do a disservice to the characters because what they're doing is they're serving the bidding of the author and they're not fully developed. And so I always say that if, if you're somebody who likes to plot out the story, yes, you're fine in that helicopter over your story, but then you got to land that helicopter and get on street level with the characters because what they see at the ground level may be something that you haven't seen from the aerial view. And when you see those moments or those little things that they discover at the street level, when you embrace those, then those characters become real. They'll still do the same things that they're supposed to do to move the story forward, but they'll do it in their way that makes it real and authentic for them. And then they become three-dimensional characters. And what's great is for the reader, they're pulled along for the ride. And now they don't anticipate what's going to happen in the story because they're just in love with the characters and what they're doing. And so when they make a discovery, it's a genuine surprise as, as opposed to somebody going, oh, yeah, I saw that plot twist coming from a mile away. You almost have to be like an investigative reporter going in behind your characters going, okay, why did you do this? What yeah. was your motivation? What was the reason? What did you expect to get out of this? And then you revise accordingly. Yeah, exactly. And why is your, your most important question to ask at any point? Yep. Well, and, and don't forget, what was it? Uh, Ernest Hemingway, no surprises for the uh, author, no surprises for the reader. Wasn't that him? You know, we remember that it's, it's okay for things to, to go off track and to go in a different direction. You know, and I'm, I'm going to shout this book out again, like I have a hundred times on this show, probably more. Um, Vicious by V.E. Schwab. Oh my God. Just marvelous. Talk about weird perspectives that will make you question your own morality um, and, and things that don't go according to what you think is any kind of plot. Uh, but it was actually absolutely delightful to read. And it's like, wow, I really wish that I read more books like that. Um, I really do. Instead of following kind of a, a standard model that sells books to just kind of take us off into the middle of nowhere and, uh, and see where we end up. You end up going on a really good adventure at that point. Mm -hmm. You you always hope so. Really Although you go ahead, Stacy. Part of the reason, yeah, but part of the reason I wanted to do um, the anthology with more of a gothic horror theme than just like horror horror theme is because 
the, the gothic angle would give the authors more opportunity to really dig deep into the characters and their motivations and how they feel and it's it's more more psychological horror not like blood and guts horror right so when we're talking about empathy and having characters um doing things because it makes sense for them as a character to do them it's so much fun to explore that in in the context of gothic horror Mm -hmm. For sure, for sure. And we have another uh, friend of the show that does, uh, well, Victoria, Victorian Gothic horror, uh, Christy Stratus. Um, and I actually haven't read her uh, Dark Victoriana collection because um, it seems pretty scary to me. But um, Wait yeah, a second, uh, you're scared of something? You know, I'll tell you what, I like to write scary stuff, but I, I don't know, sometimes reading scary stuff really does me I, mean, I don't even know you anymore. <laughs> It just gets so scary, you know. I, I, I don't even read Stephen King stuff anymore because it's like, no, Duma Key really messed up my head. I'm gonna have to go in a different direction. Here. Wow, but you know, that, it's that surprises me. Well, you know, it's it's good writing. It's the authors that can get under your skin um, and affect some kind of change. That is the best writing, in in my opinion, right there. And whether it's to scare the shit out of you or disturb you or traumatize you or to make you feel joyous. You know, it's, it's all really the same. It's, you know, using your words, connecting your readers to your soul. You know, I know that sounds a little woo woo, but you know, it's legit. We all know it. You know, we, we, we've all gotten that email or re review that really touched your heart and made you cry a little bit. And that's what it's all about is just making that human connection. I think. Now, when it comes to the different horror genres, because I, I'm supposed to be the scaredy cat here on the show. Oh, that's You're supposed for to be sure. the horror expert. That's baloney. When we're talking about these different levels of horror, what really determines the, the definition of them? Because you've mentioned uh, a Victorian horror. We've got gothic horror. We've got, what, a horror thriller. I mean, what where are the levels at? Like, what's the defining moments between those? Well, there are a lot of them, and I'll, and I'll let our, our guest have a have a swing at this one. But for me, I, I'll tell you that I, I don't want to say that psychological horror is, is what gets me, but it's usually the psychological aspects of a horror movie or book that will get me. You know, I don't care about blood and guts. I mean, none of that stuff really bothers me. But if there's an innocent person that's suffering for no reason and they can't get out of it something about that digs in deep in me and really really disturbs me if there's someone that has no part in the equation whatsoever but they're still being punished that that gets me that gets me really really hard and i don't know what to call that kind of horror is it like asshole horror <laughs> I mean, it just takes an asshole to write something like that but that's because that's what i call it but you know, I don't know. What do you guys think? What do, what do you guys think about the different types of horror that are out there? Well, I, I personally, I love psychological horror where you can play with uh, uh, the reader's imagination. Because I, I find that uh, horror is a tricky thing to write because you can have the blood and guts kind of like cheap jump scare thrills. But if you want to really affect your reader or your audience, you have to dig into like the psychology that, that's driving their fear. And, and I, I learned this when I worked in theater. I wrote a play called The Bone House, which was um, it was a bizarre sort of experimental form of theater where an audience came in uh, to what apparently was a lecture about the hunt for a serial killer that was uh, on the loose. And at the front of the room, there was a guy who claimed to be the hunter of killers, and he mapped out his case and basically said, here are these unsolved murders, and I'm connecting them all to this particular serial killer. But he talks with so much detail about like the murders that you're sitting in the audience, you start to get the creepy feeling that the guy who's supposedly the hunter is actually the killer himself and he's brought you all together to basically boast about what he's done. But it's too late, you're stuck in this theater with this guy. Now he gets to the end of his presentation and he claims he has a piece of evidence to prove his theory and he pulls out this strange little image that he's blown up for everybody in the audience and everyone's supposed to stare at this image for about a minute. And at the end of the minute, what happens is the hunter turns out the lights to the theater. The room goes so dark, you can't even see the hand in front of your eyes. 
And what happens is because you've been staring at this bizarre image for about a minute, uh, it's actually burned onto the back of your eyes. And as your eyes adjust to the dark, you actually see the face of the killer. Now, people are freaking out because they can see this floating head in front of their face. And then things get worse because the real killer makes his presence known. And it turns out he's been sitting in the audience the entire time. Now, the lights are out, so you don't see anything, but you hear uh, people chasing each other, the other around in the dark. You sometimes feel somebody bump into you. You hear gunshots go off. You hear somebody scream, the gurgle of blood in somebody's lungs. And then you hear the voice of the killer who very calmly says he's enjoyed the lecture, but the hunter got some details wrong. And while he's talking very calmly, he proceeds to gut open the hunter. Now, the lights are out, so you don't see anything, but you can hear somebody rip through a shirt. You can hear somebody crack through a rib cage, and then the killer says he has the most powerful pump known to man in his hand, the human heart. And the entire audience is splattered with a warm liquid that's blood. Uh, and I remember when we did that playback, ooh, I think it was like 1999, like people were screaming in the aisles. Like even now, like 20 years later, people still come up to me and tell me that Bonehouse was the scariest thing they ever saw. But the thing that I find fascinating is all the cheap thrills of being in the blackout and somebody grabbing you, that's not what most people remembered. What they remembered was in the middle of the play, there was a woman who apparently was a victim uh, who survived an attack from the killer. And the hunter put her under hypnosis to recall the evening where she came across the killer. And she describes a scene that most people recognize where they're walking down the street and they feel like somebody's following them. And she described the exact details of being chased and trying to run and find a safe place to go. It was that tiny little like monologue in the middle of this play that resonated with people more than anything else. So it, it, it was like really informative that if you tap into the psychology of fear into something that we think is universally uh, scary, that's really what's going to resonate with the readers. Great. Now I'm going to have freaking nightmares tonight. Sorry, Thanks, Marty. Sorry, Jake. Sorry, Jake. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like the most amazing play to have taken part in. Like I would never have wanted to be in the audience, but I could see it from the other side, just knowing what you're about to do to these people. That oh, would be the fun I, part. I, how, I did you, how did you lure the through most of it? How did you lure the audience in? What were, were, were did they know they were going to the play, or did they think it was a, a talk with a uh, the, 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 the pretense was they, they knew it was a play, but it was done as a lecture style play. Okay. And so a lot of people were coming in thinking, okay, this, we're going to get some cheap thrills about like a talk about a serial killer. Uh, and then when the blackout happened and everybody was freaking out, it was really interesting to see the psychology of the audiences because, you know, we didn't want to give away the whole, you know, the climax of the play. And uh, about 95% of the audience members kept our secret, right? They just told their friends, you got to go see this play. You have to go see this play. What's it about? I'm not going to tell you, but you have to go see this play. And we actually had, it was done during the Edmonton Fringe Festival, which is a summer theater festival. And uh, back in 1999, they didn't have online ticket sales. So people actually had to line up to get tickets to the show. And by the midpoint of the festival, uh, we had lineups of about eight hours of people trying to get tickets to the show. And they, they'd keep their mouth shut. They were like, I heard something happens at the end of the play. I don't know what it is. I just want to go see it. Wow. That is amazing. And I, I'm not going to lie. I just watched the Quirky Turkey episode of Bob's Burgers with my uh, family the other day. And that re really reminds me of that. I don't know if any of you watch Bob's Burgers. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta watch the quirky turkey quirky Thanksgiving, <laughs> Thanksgiving uh, play. Um, wow, holy cow, that is brilliant, Marty. <laughs> well, Stacy, Chris, do you have anything to add on horror genres? After that, no. I know, right? How could you follow that? <laughs> oh. Yeah, no, I just, I, I, I agree, I agree a hundred percent with Marty that the psychological is far scarier than just the, the blood and guts slasher kind of horror. Um, I mean, that's like, that's like visually disturbing and, and mentally disturbing. Yes. But I don't think that you suffer the same kind of fear as you do with a psychological horror story. Yeah. When, it when it they... digs deep into what yeah. really terrifies you as a person. Right. Yeah. When, when you have the the ones that are just kind of, you know, torture porn kind of thing, um, you know, it's, I don't know, it, it really doesn't do much. You know, it's just not scary. It's like, okay, that's disgusting and vile. And, but yeah, when they, when you take the time to, to really get that slow burn going and then, 
Whew, man, yeah, it, it gets me. Uh, Rebecca Jonesy um, has uh, kindly offered uh, some info here. She said, asshole horror is a subgenre of sub porn. Okay. That's lovely. And Rebecca, I do want to thank you. Um, on Rebecca's recommendation, I did recently purchase a bidet, and I'm very happy with it. So thank you for the for the recommendation, Rebecca. That was great. I'm Never saving on to toilet, toilet paper. Toilet paper nope. again. <laughs> no worries now. Go right back into lockdown. We're good. Well, I saw the I saw the movie Shivers. I will never use a bidet because I keep <laughs> thinking about those things going up people's butts. <laughs> She she did warn me to uh, to take it easy because it could easily become an enema. And I was like, okay, I can see that now. They, <laughs> there's not a whole lot of variation of the speed. Heading into TMI territory there. <laughs> oh goodness. Well, speaking of our other sponsor, Katie, don't don't you have some stuff? There you go. Yes, Rebecca is our second sponsor, and she's got some amazing stories for you to read. Her recent one, um, I believe it's the Madness and Shadows, is the new one that just released. And uh, she does readings on her Facebook page every Thursday, if you want to check that out. But you can also find her on her website. She is Mistress Rebecca Dirty Jonesy, and you will be entertained. And, and we I thank her for being our sponsor. Yeah, I want her to start doing readings from Mandy. Rebecca, could you do that? Because Mandy is the only one of hers that I, I've read so far. And it was, it was she something. She is fantastic at doing live readings, though. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I, I've been trying to, to read every week, and I trip over my words left and right. But I listen to her, and she sounds like such a pro. I'm, I'm so jealous, and I'm so in awe of how well she reads. Yeah, yeah, she's good. It's, it's definitely an art form. Well, our guests, thank you guys so much for coming on tonight. We really appreciate it. It was great chatting with you all. Don't forget, Monday is the grand release of this. Now, where can they find this book? Um, I think at the moment it's on Amazon, so for sure you can get it on Amazon. Um, it is being distributed by IBC, so indie bookstores should be able to order it in for you as well. Okay. Yeah, we'll make sure to put a link in our show notes after our, our recording is done. That way we can tell people where to find it. And uh, if you guys have any special events happening on Monday that you want to let us know about, we can also kind of guide people over that way as well. I'm sorry, you cut out on me. Are there any special events that any of you have going on on Monday that you want to let us know about? Uh, well, just the launch on Monday, 7 o'clock, okay. Mountain Standard Time. <laughs> okay. So Mountain Standard Time. What What is that? In... Yeah, that's, is that 7, um, 8? We're ahead of you guys. Oh. Okay. Cool, cool. We'll make sure to put all the notes again. Like I said, within about five minutes of the show being done, I usually drop all the notes in. So we'll send some people over to your page. And again, we'll put in the Amazon link so they can find you as well, too. Thank you. Well, have a good night, everybody. Thanks for, right. uh, thank you for Take tuning care. in. Sorry about the audio problems today, guys. But thank you again for watching. And we will check you out next week. Until then, see you later. All, all right. right. Have a good night.